Gravity Falls belongs to Alex Hirsch and Disney Channel. Please go support Gravity Falls and go buy Journal 3. Hi everybody, Raspberry Barrel here, and I know it's been a while, and I have been trying to stay on schedule, but it hasn't worked. <laughs> but uh, we're back now with our next reading for the Gravity Falls Journal 3. So uh, last time we left off with Fiddleford, you know, feeling kind of creeped out with everything that happened, and the portal is being made and such. So I know we all want to get into it, so let's just start. <laughs> Please forgive me if I stutter, hesitate, or mispronounce anything, and for any noises in the background. Here we go. A new concern. This morning, over ham sandwiches, my assistant brought up a troubling subject. Supposing we were indeed successful in opening the portal to the source of Gravity Falls weirdness, what if any more weirdness leaks into our dimension? Or, more tantalizingly, what if we are able to capture some new and rare creatures from this unimaginable alternate universe? In the event of such development, we will need somewhere to store and study these dangerous specimens where they can't endanger the townsfolk or interfere with our work. F has proposed we build our additional underground laboratory, one designed with the, with the utmost precautions and par paranormal security an impermeable bunker where we can contain and observe these specimens away from my home base and the possibilities of being witnessed by the townsfolk. As much as I hate to delay construction of the portal, F is right, we will begin building this containment unit at once. We found a location for our hidden storage bunker. Deep in the forest behind my cabin, there are trees so massive and powerful that many of them have stood for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. F discovered that one of them has a hollowed out trunk, making it the perfect entrance for our secret hideout. I'll admit that this project has sidetracked us a bit, but is there a scientist alive who would resist the lore of building a secret lair? Hiding spot? Question mark? With an internal system of rotating hydraulics, controlled by an access panel hidden beneath the bark. We created a hidden entrance. The excavation was difficult, but F insisted that he could do it on his own, although I could have sworn I saw some lumberjacks helping him with the, with the labor. When I questioned the lumberjacks about our secret project, however, they seemed to have forgotten the whole thing, so it must have been a figment of my overworked imagination. This hidden bunker will be the perfect place to, to store any specimen too dangerous for the outside world, and to maybe play some D&D &D and more D, if time permits. Some crossed out things here. It reminds me of the tree fort me and my brother used to build when we dreamed of being adventurers. The Bunker. The plan is coming along great. F never ceases to amaze me with his skill for construction. Just today he showed me a cellular telephone he built which was incredibly only the size of a cinder block. This place is everything. A. Bunker. For overnight research. Think I accidentally lost F's skmez dispenser down here. Don't tell him. B. Security room. Sinisterly complex trap designed to crush any intruder who doesn't have the code. Seems a bit excessive, but once F starts inventing, he can't stop. C. Observation room. To study otherworldly creatures at a safe distance, also soundproof, so we can say insulting things about our specimens freely. B. Storage room. The dirt around this is surrounded by solid bedrock and reinforced with steel. No way our specimens will escape. Mole man. No layer is complete without one. Our second thought. May want to remove his skeleton. Hopefully none are alive. Cooling chamber. Cycle C. Cooling system. We'll need to be able to freeze certain specimens for ex examination. Temperature control apparatus. F has explained that this can also be rooted into an air conditioning unit. Good, it gets hot in here. Liquid nitrogen. The heat is making me start to see things. The cryogenic temperatures can control apparatus was designed on site. Temperature can be altered within 24 hours, powered by a small battery network. 
pressure gauge, cross section, nitrogen core, insulation. F suggested freezing popsicles down here while we work. We debated briefly about flavors. He seemed to think molasses was a flavor. His, his upbringing fascinates me. Each cooling chamber holds 20 gallons of liquid nitrogen solution, enough material to freeze any biological specimen within a 200 year old span. Cool zone, airflow, airflow. F discussed how, in the event of a world war or paranormal catastrophe, these units could be used to freeze oneself with the intent to emerge in the future when trouble is past. I think he's being paranoid. I keep reminding him this is a lab, not a bomb shelter. And we have a little code here. And it's funny, but once you decode it, it says ice, ice, baby. <laughs> figure C, figure B, some things. It says way out. I have to admit that my assistant really topped himself with the security precautions. F says it was inspired by the popular Russian arcade puzzle game, Soviet Blocks, although I think it looks more like his beloved cube puzzle. Either way, this ever-changing mechanical trap is designed to perplex and capture a creature of any possible size and shape. Sometimes I think how fortunate I am to be friends with F, because if this room is any indication, it would be terrifying to be his enemy. I have written down the security code here, because if I ever forget it, it will be the last mistake I ever make. And then I'm just gonna, here's, you know, on the page, look for yourself. You can see his equation. I'm not gonna try to read that. <laughs> security room, whole bunch of symbols. Keep out intruders. I may wish to keep my remaining college grant money down here. This lock is more impenetrable than any bank on earth and no long lines. Cryogenic tubes. We found our first specimen. During the dig, I discover a large blue egg containing an utterly bizarre creature. This squishy, maggot-like hatchling has a unique ability. He can transform his body into anything he sees. I quickly caged this marvel and have been feeding him F's canned beans, which he devours ravenously. F says we should freeze it right away to test out our cryonics, but I've grown attached to the little creature. Found while excavating. Watch your fingers. Liquid nitrogen. DNA constantly changes. Tests. DNA replication. For the past week, I have conducted all, all manner of tests on the specimen, whom I named Shifty, to get a sense of his unique biological makeup. Although I have yet to determine his origin, I have recorded countless incredible forms. Shifty has such a delightful temperament, transforming into a tail-wagging dog when he's happy, and a prickling sea urchin when he's sad. I have shown him photos of a number of different animals, and he always matches them perfectly. Although I am careful to only show him small herbivores, the books on large predators are strictly off limits. I have also become careful to wear a surgical mask while around him. The possible repercussions if he got a good look at my face are somewhat unnerving. Every day, Shifty grows bigger and bigger. I had to upgrade from the small kennel box to a full-size steel cage. While working late in the bunker, I heard a high, otherworldly parrot-like voice call out, Beans. Shifty has learned how to speak a few words at first, but every day he's been learning longer sentences. Increasingly, he asks, Who am I? He is an avid learner and has asked on multiple occasions to see my journal, but I have declined for obvious reasons. There are over 100 forms in this book that I never want to see him take. Fiddleford has become increasingly skeptical of the creature, reminding me every day that the only reason we're keeping him is to test the cryogenic tube once it's complete. Apparently, F's farmhand upbringing has made him unsentimental towards what he sees as livestock. Something odd. Changing DNA. Trouble in the bunker. 
One night while working late, F came to me in a panic. He was coughing a lot, said he had a sore throat, and asked if he could look in my journal for a remedy. His throat really did sound awful, but I told him to simply use the cough drops in the first aid cabinet. He grew increasingly insistent that only the journal had the answer. Finally, I relented and went to my bunker to find the journal. As I was unlocking the door, I heard what sounded like muffled screaming coming from a cabinet. I opened it up and I was shocked to discover F, my assistant, bound by a rope and gagged with a sock. In an instant, the grim horror of what had happened came over me. My eyes shot to Shifty's steel cage, which had been busted open. I untied F, whose anxiety had rendered him nearly mute, and we quickly concocted a plan. Using some gold spray paint, I drew a crude six-fingered hand on a plumbing manual. I tossed it in one of our cryonic tubes, and then ran back to the surveillance room. The, the imposter, F, had been waiting impatiently, shaking involuntarily in his chair, and noticed that his hands were so strong they had bent the steel in the armrest. I told him that in my carelessness I had left my journal in the cryonics room. Do not let out. Form number six. Extremely unpredictable. It's too powerful. He darted off for the journal. And the instant he stepped inside the cryonics tube, I slammed the red button, trapping him in. He screamed and took on a form I had never seen. He pounded on the glass and froze before my eyes. I felt remorseful for having to freeze my former pet, but even worse that I have been fooled and that F had almost paid the price. It can transform. After this incident, we'd both lost a bit of our momentum on this storage concept. We agreed to put this thing behind us, seal off the security measures, and return after the portal was complete. If this creature ever escapes, it's a thought too horrifying for me to imagine. I may rip out these pages to sleep better at night. It's playing tricks on me. A little code right here. It says, am I me? Is he me? An encounter. I apologize profusely to F for another traumatic experience. I told him that once we complete the portal, all of this will have been worth it. We're almost there. And some cipher right here. This is just the Caesar cipher, and it says, once you decode it, my muse has warned me that my assistant may not be comp committed to the cause. He thinks that F is not bold enough to follow through. I worry he might be right. We have nearly completed the portal and will soon be ready to test it, but we have several more long nights before our work will be ready. I recently find myself frustrated by the necessity of sleep. Think, if the average person sleeps eight hours a day, they will spend approximately one third of their entire life asleep. What a waste! In this regard, I find myself especially jealous of my muse. He has discussed with me at length the freedoms afforded to him by virtue of being a non- corporal and entity. He is free, truly free, from the physical and biological restraints of our world. This past evening around midnight, it was my assistant who first succumbed to fatigue. The 13 cups of coffee I had given him, and record of frenzied bluegrass we were playing still, weren't enough to keep him awake. He chided me, as he often does, for staying up too late. Don't forget what happened to Icarus, he told me, as he packed up his things and left. He didn't flap hard enough, I replied. As impressive as F's mechanical knowledge is, he sometimes frustrates me. I knew that if we needed to stay on schedule, I would need to work at least another three hours. But as the minutes ticked by, I too began to feel fatigue's wretched powers pull on my eyelids. It was at this moment that my muse appeared before me with a tantalizing offer. He said he took pity on my frail human body and offered to take it over for a while to help me finish my calculations while I slept. I can think of few times I have ever I have known such gratitude. It was almost as though he had read my mind. He held out his hand and I gradually gladly accepted. 
although I know that the image of him I see only exists within my mind, it insists that when my hand was engulfed in the blue flames, I felt a physical chill. It fascinated me. Code down here at the bottom. Thanks for letting me borrow your body, Sixer. Enjoy the mystery, bruises. To put your hand in fire and not get burned, this is a feeling like no other. I awoke this morning to find that my muse was true to his word. There in my notebook were six hours worth of beautifully written calculations, perfectly sufficient to keep me on schedule. My assistant's expression when he, when he saw me fully alert and smiling with a huge stack of calculations at my side, I had to stifle my laughter. If only he knew the powers of my imaginary friend. Update. Several hours after the experience with my muse, I experienced a burning pain in my right eye. Probably just a headache. I have attached a monocle to this book to help me read with one eye until it goes away. I hope it doesn't bleed. Very odd. And that's where we're going to end it today. I hope you all enjoyed and hopefully we can get to the next part soon enough and it's not going to be a super long wait again. But thank you all for your patience. I hope you all enjoyed this reading. We'll see you all next time. Have a great rest of your day. Goodbye. Gravity Falls and Journal 3 belong to Alex Harsh and Disney Channel. Please go support Gravity Falls and go buy Journal 3.